Hey all, Professor Tracy back with another contracts video. This one on the defenses of misrepresentation and non-disclosure. So we're adding two more defenses to our list of defenses that occur at contract formation. So these will start with the first, which is misrepresentation. And we'll see that there are a number of elements to misrepresentation, but at its core, it's not all that complicated. So what you wanna look for when you're looking at a fact pattern and trying to decide, is this somewhere I should be uh, trying out the elements of misrepresentation and analyzing, seeing if that defense will work here, uh, you wanna look for a statement of fact before the contract. I put it in kind of scare quotes there because well, it, it, the way we think about the word fact indicates that if it's a fact, it's actually true. That's the state of things. We'll explain why we use the word fact. We're using it to distinguish it from an assertion of opinion. Uh, and we'll unpack that more in just a second. But the scare quotes are there just because it is a little weird to say it's a statement of fact if, and if what we're uh, getting at there is the person's asserting it, but it's actually false. So... Um, that that statement of fact, one, one of the things in element one I didn't mention and emphasize is it must be before the contract, meaning that a statement must be made before the parties enter into the agreement. The statement must be made by one of the contract parties or one of their agents. So either the parties making it themselves or someone who is legally acting on their behalf. And the statement must be false. It must be false. And that we sit, we require that that statement, that statement being made by a contract party or their agent that is false must either be fraudulent or material. And we'll see that by fraudulent, what we mean is that it's being made by the maker of the statement. It's being made with the intent to mislead. And it's also being uh, done purposely, intentionally, as opposed to a material misrepresentation is a mistaken, an innocent uh, misrepresentation. And we'll say more about that as we look at each of these elements. And that statement that's been made must induce the other party to assent to the agreement. And when we say induce, you'll see other places, uh, sometimes courts or supplements or case books you may be reading, may be using the phrase actual reliance, meaning that did the party actually rely on this representation when they assented to the agreement. The word inducement is getting at a similar idea. Is this some part of what induced the party to enter into the agreement? And then we ask whether that inducement or reliance was reasonable or justifiable is another phrase you'll often see used in this context. So those are our elements. Let's look at an example that just gets the basic idea out there and then we'll look at each of the elements. So this first example here, we've got Bob, we've got Barb, and Barb is talking to Bo about the possible purchase of his home. And she says, I'm really concerned, I'm really concerned about roaches. I know a lot of homes in the neighborhood have had issues with roach infestations. Maybe some of our neighbors have had problems, but not us. Never seen a single roach in the house. And so, but here's the actual fact, right? Bo's house is filled with roaches. So he's making an assertion that is counter to the facts of what is actually going on with his house. And here he's realizing this. He's saying it, right? He recognizes what he's saying, saying right? Well, I seen some, but they mostly come at night. Mostly. So he's thinking it to himself. He's not saying that out loud. So he recognizes here that he knows there are roaches and he has said to the contrary. Uh, so, but he, so Barb says, well, that's a relief. I love the house, but I can't stand roaches. They gross me out. Ew. 
Right. Uh, absolutely no roaches here. Uh, you're in luck. So Bob here is he's sort of doubling down, if you if you will, on this idea, right? He's made the assertion. He doesn't correct himself. Instead, he doubles down and, and says, no, really, there are no roaches here, even though he knows there are. And so here he's making that statement with the intent to get her to rely on it or to induce her to enter into the agreement. And so here uh, Barb says, well, you're the one living there. You would know. I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, right. You have to rely on me. But honestly, you've got nothing to worry about. It's a great house and 100% roach free. Sounds good. I'll, I'll take it. So she's induced, right? So she actually relies on it. And there we had that sort of interlude about reasonable reliance or, or justifiable reliance, which is this, it will say more about what that looks like. But there uh, she has, she's taking Bo's word for it. She doesn't have any knowledge to the contrary. There's nothing when she's at the house now with Bo, there's nothing indicating that there are roaches. She's taking his word for it. And we'll talk about, well, is that okay or not okay? Um, is that, or is that kind of just being stupid if you don't say, well, I should get, uh, have some sort of pest inspection or what have you. And, and we'll talk about that. So here they enter. So she is induced, right? They enter into the agreement. They have a contract that they've entered into and then they perform it. Barb is giving, paying the purchase price for the home. Uh, Bo is uh, delivering the deed to the home. And then she moves in, has her furniture in there, and there are all these roaches. So she discovers that she's been lied to by Bo, that he misrepresented the facts of the situation. And so she tries to sue to rescind, right? Because she can remember that with most of these defenses, they can either be brought as a defense against a claim that you have breached, or they can be used to sue to rescind the agreement, which is what she's doing in this case. And she would likely be successful. As we'll see, all the elements appear to be met, right? That Bo made a, a, a statement of fact before they entered, before Barb and she, or before Barb and Bo entered into the agreement. That statement was false, right? Because he made that, it is not true that there are, there are roaches at the house. Um, and that was, and in this case, it was likely fraudulent. It was likely fraudulent. Even if it weren't, it would very likely be material. And we'll talk more about what those mean. It doesn't need to be both, right? If it's fraudulent, it doesn't need to be material. If it's material, it doesn't need to be fraudulent. So um, we, we don't need both. One or the other will do. Here, Bo knows that his assertion is is false, right? So he is knowingly, he knows that it's it's false and he's making the statement intentionally to mislead or to induce Barb into the agreement. So it would likely fit under the heading of fraudulent. Even if it didn't, it would certainly be material because it would matter even to a reasonable person if the home were infested with roaches. Not that that's a completely incorrectable problem, but for most people, the average buyer of a home, it's going to matter. It's going to be material because it is likely that they would not buy the home if it was infested with roaches. So either way here, uh, it, it, whether we want to try it, it should, to argue it as a fraudulent misrepresentation or material, it likely would work. So Barb is very likely to succeed here, which means that the contract will be disaffirmed or voided and rescinded, right? Pulled back such that Barb gets her money back and that uh, Bo would then get the deed back. Now realize that the rescission could be much more complex than that, depending on how long Barb was living in the home before she became aware of the problem. She may have to pay for the use of that home, um, but there could also be things like if Barb lived there and she paid uh, like property taxes, things like that, while she was living there and now Bo's getting it back, then she may be entitled to some compensation for that. So it could be a little bit more complex of a rescission, but and uh, with our, if we just assume everything happened instantane, more or less instantaneously, she moved in and immediately there was a roach problem. 
then yeah, the deed would go back, the money would go back, and we're we're fined. It's been rescinded. So those are the elements, right? The, the six elements we laid out. They can be broken up any number of ways. This is probably uh, arguably more complex than it needs to be with six here, but um, we're going to look at each of these. So let's start with a statement of fact before the contract, a statement of fact before the contract. So a second example here, which is going to be a little more targeted, which is a statement of fact, fact. So what do we mean by that? This, this is a statement of fact, right? When Bo goes, no, the house doesn't have any roaches. I'm not an animal. That statement, uh, he's asserting it as if it's a fact. It does not have roaches, right? So even though it may not, if it's false, to our sort of modern ears, the word fact doesn't seem to apply, right? Well, it's not a fact if it's untrue, right? Fact sort of denotes truth. Here we're just saying he's making assertion as if it is factually the case that there are no roaches. And so that's what we're getting at. And that's as opposed to an opinion, which would be something like this. It's the cleanest house you'll ever find. That's just, that's not a fact, right? That's not, you're just saying it's the cleanest house you'll ever find. That's his opinion. That's, that's clearly a statement of opinion where when someone says things like, uh, that, that, that this car sure is a dandy, something like that, that is just an opinion, right? Or this, it's got a smooth ride or look at the shine on that car. Uh, those kinds of things are just opinion um, and they are typically, they are not actionable as misrepresentation being that we view, we if it's a statement of opinion, it's not just that, oh, our first element isn't met. Typically what we say is, well, not only does it not satisfy that element, but the reason we don't allow it is because we don't believe somebody is justified in relying on a statement of opinion, right? Because if it's just an opinion, then why would you rely on it if it's obviously just somebody giving an opinion? You're not justified in relying on it. It's not reasonable to rely on it. And so we need to distinguish between someone making, making an assertion as if it's a fact and just giving a, a statement of opinion. However, it, it is, of course, more complicated than that because law is more complicated than that, in that we need to distinguish when we talk about opinion, statements of opinion, well, is it always the case that a statement of opinion will never provide a basis for a, a defense of misrepresentation? And the answer is, no, that's not true, because sometimes an opinion, so when somebody asserts something as an opinion, it is implying the truth of certain underlying facts, right? That by giving this opinion, they're actually implying something about the surrounding facts or the underlying facts of this transaction when they give that opinion. But there are some assertions which are, are true, which are truly just what we would call opinion only. And in those instances, there is no uh, implied assertion of fact. There's no implication about the state of the facts that's being made. So if we have a situation where the opinion, and we'll look at an example, right? So don't worry if you're like, well, I don't get it, Tracy. Well, we'll look at an example, but here, if we have something on this first category of an opinion that implies the truth of certain facts, then that allows us to assert a, a defense of misrepresentation because if the opinion is implying the truth of certain facts, then the, the recipient of that statement, that opinion, is justified in relying on it as if it's an assertion of fact, as if it's true, if that's what's being done, as opposed to if it's if it's just an opinion that is not giving any indication about the underlying facts, then the recipient of that statement, right? Because we, we have the two parties, the maker of the misrepresentation and the recipient of that misrepresentation. But the recipient here, if it's only an opinion, is not justified in relying on something that's strictly an opinion. And it does not provide a basis for misrepresentation. So if we look at this first category, want an opinion that implies the truth of certain facts, well, what would be an example? Here's an example. When Bo says, 
In my opinion, no one behind the house needs to worry about pest and vermin. There, he's giving an, he's making a, something, a statement that sounds like an opinion, right? And even says, in my opinion. But that statement is implying something about the underlying facts of the house when saying, oh, in my opinion, no one needs to worry about any sort of past in the house. That would include roaches, that he's implying there isn't any problem with pest or vermin in the house. Even though he's not asserting it as a statement of fact, his opinion is certainly ba implying a truth about the underlying facts. And in that case, that is that this would work for purposes of misrepresentation. So, but what about on the right side here, right? Where we're saying, but aren't there some things that are opinion only that don't make any sort of implied assertions about the facts? And the answer is yes. Well, what are they? Something like this, when Bo says, it's a great little house. My family and I love living here. So that, okay, that's fine. What, what am I to imply from that, right? That there's no assertion, That's there's no... Uh, it, that that's a statement of opinion about we've loved living here. It's a great little house. Okay, that's great, but that doesn't tell us anything. There's nothing we, that he's asserting there about the uh, about sort of the underlying facts uh, of the house. That's that's much more close to something that we would say is just a just a statement of opinion and therefore would not serve as the basis for a defense of misrepresentation. So yes, right, but uh, we'll see, it gets a little more complicated because of course, when we look at it, when we're in this side of opinion only, there are of course exceptions, right? There are exceptions. And because uh, we're learning the law, we're in law school, it, it's kind of a meme, right? That, well, every, every rule has an exception, including this one, right? That there are, there are exceptions though. And that's true in this case. Um, when we talk about, well, if it's strictly an opinion, then it, it won't serve as the basis for misrepresentation. The answer is, well, sometimes it might, it might, and here are a couple of common reasons that it might. And I'm not going to give examples to every single one of these, but I'll, I'll say a few words about them, which is to say the first here is if the maker of the statement and the recipient, uh, so if the person giving the opinion, right, the maker there, the maker of the misrepresentation, the person giving the false opinion um, and, and the recipient of that statement is... Are if they are in a relationship of trust and confidence. So an example that is often given here is if you have somebody like a financial advisor or a lawyer, some sort of other expert that you are in or that is advising you in a relationship of trust and confidence. And part of the very reason you go to them is to get their opinion, their opinion. And we, we uh, for instance, as lawyers, talk about giving people our, our legal opinion uh, that we are giving them advice and opinion about it. In that case, they are justified in relying on that statement of opinion, even if we are not implying anything uh, directly about the state of the facts, right? If we can't put it in the left-hand side of our analysis and going, well, this, you know, is couched as an opinion, but really it's a statement about the underlying facts. Um, no, this we're saying, even if it's purely opinion, if it's false uh, and you're in a relationship of trust and confidence with the recipient, then it can serve as the basis for a misrepresentation claim. Um, similarly, if there's a situation where the recipient of the statement, the false opinion, uh, reasonably believes that the person that has made this, given this false opinion, that as compared to them, this person has specialized knowledge or skill or judgment or objectivity with regard to the subject matter of the opinion. So there's a famous case, for instance, where a lady who is in her 50s is told by a dance instructor that she will make a great dancer one day. Um, and in that situation, even though that is obviously a statement of opinion, 
uh, given that this person reasonably believed that when they went and talked to this instructor, this expert, this person with, with skill and judgment and not specialized knowledge about dance and allegedly with objectivity about somebody's uh, skill as a dancer, that that uh, opinion could, even though it's just an opinion, w the, it could nonetheless be the basis for an action and uh, for a defense of misrepresentation. If you know, if it results in, in as it did in the case with the woman entering into a contract, etc. So here, the the final one is this that we're if the recipient for some reason is particularly susceptible to misrepresentation of the sort involved the you know and this is a somewhat mushy exception but you will find cases where courts have said that somebody is particularly naive or gullible and not to the extent where we're saying, oh, they were, they, you know, hypothetically, there could be another defense lurking here if we're, if, we're, if we're, depending on the circumstance, right? Like if it's somebody who's very young, well, they may have a minority defense. If it's somebody who's mentally incompetent, obviously they may be able to argue mental incapacity. Likewise, if they're intoxicated or on meds or something that makes them, you know, not alcohol, but similarly suffering from incapacity similar to intoxication, then they could look to those defenses. But closely related to that, you will find courts that say that an opinion, a statement of opinion given to someone who is particularly susceptible, if they're particularly gullible or young or naive, um, they, they have allowed people in that position to assert the defense of misrepresentation, even though what's, what's in, at stake is really just someone's opinion. So here then, so that's a statement of fact before the contract, right? That, well, that's what we were looking at we, on the first part of that. Now let's look at the before the contract part uh, so that we get to see that. And that's about the timing. The statement has to be made before, like this at the beginning, the very first thing, if Bo says, no, the house doesn't have any roaches, I'm not an animal. There, you know, the truth of the matter is it does have roaches. And then if we jump ahead, in, uh, instead of going through the, the whole scenario again to when they entered in the agreement, it's clear that he made that statement before they formed the contract, right? But not after. So if the sequence of events was this, Barb going, sounds good, I'll take it. And the contract forms and then, and then Barb asks, now the house doesn't have any roaches, does it? Nope, nope, of course there are no roaches. I'm not an animal. There, that happens after they already entered into it, so it will not serve as the basis for it, the defense of misrepresentation. Right? It's just straight up timing. So the, the second element then we said was that the statement has to be made by one of the, the contract parties or her agent. So an example that would be what? This. Nope, house doesn't have any roaches, I'm not an animal. So it's Bo, right, who's made the statement, right? Again, it's a false statement. We know this is the reality of what's going on in its house. It's like, meanwhile, back at base, right, while Bo's making this statement. Then uh, we jump ahead and we, they, we see that they entered in the agreement. Well, obviously, Bo is a party to the contract. We can see this, right, that they entered into it. But what if it's somebody unrelated to the transaction like this? I'm worried. What do you think? Do you think Bo's house has roaches? Of course not. Are there are any roaches in Bo's house. He's not an animal. And so that doesn't work, right? That statement, it is incorrect, but he it, it is false, but it is not Bob is not a party to the contract, nor is he Bo's agent. So that would not, Bob's statement, even if that induced her, right, tipped Barb over the edge and made her decide to buy the house, wouldn't serve as a basis for misrepresentation. So let's look at the third one, which is it's gotta be false, which seems pretty obvious. Here's the way that you wanna think about it though, because the, it, it intellectually, it can get a little bit of a, a conundrum, but you wanna think when we say false, what we mean is that the statement is not in accord with the facts, the actual facts, the truth of the matter. And so here, when Bo says, we had roaches when we first moved in, but I took care of them, there aren't any now. And if there are some now, 
then he's made a statement that's not in accord with the facts, right? It's not in accord with the facts. So, but th so that would be what we mean by false, that at the time he made the statement, it wasn't in accord with the facts. But what if he says, we do have some roaches, but I'll take care of them before closing, so no need to worry. So there, he's promised to take care of them. And if we jump ahead and it turns out that he did not take care of them, right? He did not later take care of them. Then you might say, well, wasn't that a misrepresentation? And the ant, it wasn't that false and not for purposes of misrepresentation, right? Did he breach? If that was part of the contract, then yes. But the reason I have this as opposed to non-performance is precisely that. If we view this as just Bob, or excuse me, not Bob, Bo, we got to keep our character straight, right? So Bo here, if what Bo is saying is, I will do this. And if this is part of the agreement between he and Barb, and he doesn't do it, then he that is just a matter of non-performance. It turns out that he lied that he didn't take care of it. But at the time he made the statement, there was nothing not in accord with the facts, right? It was a true statement at the time he made it. And we're not judging it by, oh, he didn't perform because then every breach could be turned into some weird claim for misrepresentation, right? Misrepresentation is about, did the person make a statement, a false statement, before the contract was made in order to induce the recipient of that statement into the agreement. And that's not here. We have a statement by him and maybe it did induce Barb to, to buy the house, but nonetheless, it wasn't about the state. Of, it was different from these uh, the previous statement, which was there are no roaches now and there were still roaches. This is, yes, there are, but I will take care of them. And then he doesn't. And that is not, does not fit within our false, our definition of what's false. And that's important to understand, right? She finds the roaches and that would give her, that would not be, this, would, this situation would not be a situation where she would be able to assert misrepresentation as a defense. Now, if this promise was, was legally enforceable because it was part of the contract, then that his not, Bo's non-performance would certainly be a breach and she could address it in that way. So what about then the next element, which is that, um, it, is it fraudulent or material? And here, I mentioned this when we went through the elements, it doesn't need to be, to be both, it can be either. And when we say fraudulent, we're meaning two things by fraudulent, that the maker of the statement in most of, in our example so far, Bo, that he's consciously aware that it's false, right? That that's the, the stereotypical or typical way we think of some a statement being fraudulent in contract law would be that the maker of the statement is knows they're aware of the falsity of the statement so we say that it's consciously false and that it, it's the statements being made with the intent to mislead the intent to mislead both of those things are present in order for us to call it fraudulent so what do we mean consciously false here's what we mean if if barb says i'm really concerned about roaches i know a lot of homes in the neighborhood have had issues with roach infestations maybe some of our neighbors have had problems but not us never seen a single roach in the house so there right it, it, he's at the facts are this that we can say it is false but is he conscious of it and this is what makes it conscience, right? Well, he, if he says this, if he knows this in his head, he's thinking, well, I've seen some, but they mostly come at night, mostly. So, so there, he knows what he's said is false. He's aware, right? This isn't innocent. It's consciously false. And we could go further, right, and say, well, did he intend to mislead? If we continue with the facts, right, and he says... And Barb says, well, that's a relief. I love the house, but I can't stand roaches. They gross me out. Ew. Right. Uh, absolutely no roaches here. You're in luck. So here, remember, he is he's doubling down on this. And he says, and Barb goes, well, you're the one living there. You, you would know. 
I'll have to take your word for it. So he's now, and like, right, like he keeps going further down the road here, where his intent now is clearly to in get her to induce her to accept the agreement. He has intent. Right. You have to rely on me, but honestly, you've got nothing to worry about. It's a great house and 100% brooch free. So there, and she's induced into the agreement, right? Sounds good. I'll take it. So there, right, we can say that is, right, that is exactly that, right? That it's, it's fraudulent. Um, because if we go back, I feel like I... I have things about it, that he's intending to mislead her, right? He's not only aware of the falsity, but he's intending to mislead her. So let's let's look then, right? So we said it could be, it's material, right? We said, right, fraudulent. With four here, we said that it could be fraudulent or material. So by material, we mean what? That material, something may be material either under what we would say is the object, an objective standard, which is the primary way, right? That is, if you look historically, how was misrepresentation understood? It would be using an objective standard. We'd ask, would have induced a reasonable recipient? So uh, would this statement made to the recipient here, would it have induced a reasonable recipient to make the contract? In other words, would it have mattered to that person such that, that that would have induced them into the agreement. Um, subjective is 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 more modern, and you'll find, yes, courts have done that, right? Where they where what we mean by subjective here is if the maker knew the misrepresentation was likely to induce the particular recipient to make the contract. So if they know that, right, if they know this. You know, while it may not have induced a reasonable person, the maker of the statement knew subjectively that it mattered to this other person, to the to the recipient of the statement, and that that makes it material, right? That they they have to have it know that it matters to that person. And again, there, keep in mind here, it doesn't have to be fraudulent. Although that it begins to sound close to that of like, well, don't aren't they uh, intending to mislead the person? Not necessarily, right? What they know is that they know it matters to that person, so that's why they're making the statement. I, I would think it gets awfully close. They're simply, um, they know that it matters to that person. It's likely to induce that person. Um, but that's all that needs to be shown, right? We don't have to show that they knew the statement was false or that um, they made it with an intent to mislead. So here's an example. I'm really concerned about roaches. I know a lot of homes in the neighborhood have had issues with roach infestations. So here, right, Bo is, Bo is concerned, right? I don't recall seeing one since about 10 years ago when we moved in. So at this point, he's, he's, he's thinking, I don't recall it, right? I don't recall there being any since 10 years ago we had him dealt with. So he says, we had some roaches when we first moved in, but we took care of them. I haven't seen one for years. But the reality is there are roaches, right? So meanwhile, back at base, uh, Bo's house is full of roaches. So he's made a statement that is false. It is not in accord with the facts. And he made it innocently though, right? Like he, he didn't, it wasn't consciously false. He did not believe there to be roaches. And so, so it's not, we wouldn't call it fraudulent. However, we would look at it and say, it is material. It is material, right? And here, if you were to look at all the various, you know, uh, slides we've gone through in this fact pattern, obviously, objectively, a re it would matter to a reasonable person. It, it, if, it, if there were a big roach problem, it would likely turn most people off from buying the home. Um, and that they would not want to enter into the transaction, or at least not at the price that is likely on the table, that they would want it for less. Um, and so it would matter objectively. And in here, certainly it matters subjectively to Barb, and Bo would know that by all the statements Barb has made about her disgust uh, with regard to roaches. So that's element four. Element five, we said it has to induce the other party or the other party must actually rely on this misrepresentation. 
So what do we mean by that? Relied on the misrepresentation and manifesting assent. So like this, well, you're the one living there. You would know, I'll have to take your word for it. Right, you have to rely on me, but honestly, you've got nothing to worry about. It's a great house, 100% roach free. So here at this point, we're not concerned about whether it was reasonable or justifiable. She says, sounds good, I'll take it. And then she, so she does actually rely on it. It does induce her into the agreement. So we're saying, did she actually rely on it? And the answer is yes, she did, right? She, she relied exclusively on Bo's representation that there were no roaches. So what about reliance on if she were to rely on her own investigation? And this is a common example of where there is not inducement or not actual reliance. So let's suppose it unfolds like this instead. That sounds good, but I'd like to give a, get a pest inspection done before I agree to purchase the house. Are you open to that? Uh, of, of course, of course. Why would I be concerned about a pest inspection? Uh, no big deal. Have at it. So we have the pest inspection. It shows no problems. And she comes back and says, pest inspection looks good. No roach problems. That was my only real concern. So I'll take the house. So there, you want to contrast those two examples, right? In the first, she is relying, she is induced by Bo's actual statement. Whereas if it's the case in the second that she's relying on her own investigation, hiring a pest, you know, getting a pest inspection and relying on that, then it, she cannot claim to have been induced or to have actually relied on Bo's misrepresentation. And so that's what you want to be careful of here to say, is there inducement or not? It's a matter of sort of, of causation. And here there would not be the cause of her entering into it. If it's the clean inspection, then the cause was not then Bo's statement. So we said it's got to, there's got to be reasonable or justifiable reliance. So not just that there was reliance or uh, inducement, but that there was, it's justifiable. Um, and so what do we mean by that? How does that look? So here, this is key, which is why I put it here even in this slide when it's, you know, this long statement, but the, the because there's always this temptation to want to say the person could have gotten a pest inspection. They could have done this. It wasn't reasonable for them to rely on Bo's statement, etc. So here, but the failure to investigate the facts before making the contract will not generally preclude avoidance of the contract. It will not preclude the person from asserting the defense of misrepresentation. So the fact that, that Barb exclusively relies on Bo's investigation, on Bo's statement, not investigation, but Bo's statement or his representation does not preclude the, her defense. It is not unreasonable or unjustifiable because otherwise you are going to destroy the defense and courts do not, they give a lot of leeway. And the reason being, why is it that it should be okay for the other person to lie and mislead the person to try to, in, to induce them in the agreement? And then you, you're, you're basically saying, well, as, as long as you can always point to say, well, they could have done their own investigation, that there's always an out and we should just let the person's bad behavior go. And a surprising number of students over the years say that. And that is not how courts have historically looked at this, nor is it how they look at it now. And so you should not look at it either if you want to do well in contracts and law school and you want to do well in the bar exam. Do not look at it that way um, because that is favoring the maker of the misrepresentation and allowing them getting away with misrepresentation. And we do not do that. Does that mean you can always, it's always justified? No, and we'll see some examples. But so here's how it's often phrased. If it's obviously false, if the statement the person is making, the maker of the representation, if that is obviously pause, false or clearly should not have been taken seriously, then you as the recipient of that statement are not 
justified and relying on it. It is not, your reliance is not justified. It is not reasonable. If it is obviously false, like what? Like this. So the, Barb is at Bo's house and there are roaches running around. I'm really concerned about roaches. I know a lot of homes in the neighborhood have had issues with roach infestations. Maybe some of our neighbors have had problems, but not us. Never seen a single roach in the house, right? If there are obviously roaches going around, what can we say? It's obviously false, right? It should not be taken seriously. So in that, if there are, if the, if it's obvious that what the person is saying is incorrect, is false, then no, you are not justified in relying on it, nor are you justified relying on it if you already know it's false, if you already have facts to the contrary. Just because you know for some other reason, then you are not justified in relying on it. Those are the kinds of situations we have in view when we say justifiable or reasonable reliance. So let's look at non-disclosure, which is closely related but different, right? They're, both of these defenses are about the, the, the party, the, the victim, right? Here, the recipient in, in misrepresentation. Uh, that It's about that person being misled, right? Misled either through an affirmative statement, uh, affirmative you know, actions that are taken, or in the case of non-disclosure, by inaction, by the failure to say something. But either way, the person is misled. And the general rule, and you've, I'm sure people have heard this before, we use phrases like caveat emptor, buyer beware, that there is a common law, no affirmative duty to disclose all the, the facts that you have. You don't have to disclose everything that's wrong with the property or everything that's wrong with the car. Now, um, that, so that's our general rule. However, even the common law has developed exceptions to this and the uninformed party, meaning the party that was not given the, this information, the information was not disclosed to them, we allow them to rescind the contract, to disaffirm or to void the contract because if the non-disclosed facts, A, have, or, or one, I should say, it's not an A, have a material effect on the transaction, that the facts are not readily observable. This is very similar to saying, was the reliance justifiable? If the facts are readily observable, then a claim of you didn't disclose this to me is garbage, right? Because it's like, okay, it may have been material and it may have not been told to you, but you obviously should have been able to observe the truth of the situation. And so you have to show, and I think this is closely related, that to number two, which is that it's not otherwise known to the uninformed party, right? They don't otherwise have that knowledge. And um, the way the rule is, is broken out, um, and a lot of the materials I use in my class is to say that, hey, there are four circumstances that in which the, the duty to disclose crops up. But for each and every one of these, we, we have to show that the, the non-disclosed facts, uh, they have a material effect on the transaction. They're not readily observable. They're not otherwise known to the un quote unquote uninformed party. And, th and then one of these four circumstances must apply. And what are they? Well, this is, this is sort of the obvious one and, and probably the, the by far the most common, which is that there are reams and reams of federal and state laws and, you know, county laws that are required disclosure of certain information. For instance, if you're buying or selling a house, you often have to disclose things just by operation of law, right? Like whether there's lead paint, that kind of thing. There's all kinds of other things that, you know, depending on the state you're in, um, you might, you will have to disclose. But there's some com fairly common things that have to be disclosed. And the reason the statute exists is because at common law, you wouldn't have had to disclose it. So to change that, the, the state legislators step in and pass a statute mandating that that information be 
disclose to a buyer of the home. That's common, but any there are reams of consumer protection statutes or consumer protection laws at this point that require disclosure. And you would just want to look at which ones are applicable in whatever situation you're handling. So the idea, so the materials I'm using put intentional concealment under non-disclosure. Here's the important thing to understand though about intentional concealment. It is effectively misrepresentation. And um, I think could be just viewed as another way of making a informative statement, right? A, a, a false representation and treat it as a misrepresentation a, uh, because intentional concealment isn't just non-disclosure. It, is it is taking affirmative steps either through one's conduct or through your your speech, uh, your words, to conceal something from the other party. So yes, it, it is true that you are hiding a, a information and therefore not disclosing it, but ultimately you're affirmatively doing something to mislead the other person. It is not merely a matter of I am not I am not divulging this information to you. It could be like I'm I'm covering up things in the house, right? Putting uh, strategically placing boxes and furniture and plants and things to cover up defect, you know, to cover up termite damage or water damage or whatever it is to try to to hide something but that is a that is that kind of concealment could just as easily be dealt with under misrepresentation as the false statement that i am making a false statement by doing what by concealing this i am presenting it as if the facts are there is not this water damage there is not there are not termite there is not termite damage there are not you know reams and reams of brooches or there's not lots you know leaking pipes or whatever it may be i am concealing something from you actively such that it, it can be treated in that way i'm putting it here though because uh the materials i'm using uh listed under non-disclosure although even the materials i'm using give some acknowledgement that it it is probably under it, it is understood as a form of a false misrepresentation so the, the way that you would think at, at, at strictly sort of common law exceptions, right? So this, you have statutes, which you want to be think of, intentional concealment being just really a form of, of misrepresentation. The, the two uh, I think of as being sort of strictly sort of common law exceptions are if the parties are in a relationship of trust or confidence, it doesn't need to be what's called a, a fiduciary relationship. It doesn't need to qualify as that. Uh, it can be something less than that. So it could be a parent and a child, a guardian and a child, situations like that, where we'd say it's a relationship of trust and confidence such that the the failure to give that information would be uh, would be actionable, right? That, that the failure, there is a duty to disclose and the failure to do it, assuming you can show that the information is material, that it's not open and obvious and uh, readily observable, I guess is the phrase we're using here, and uh, that it's not otherwise known to the party, then, uh, then in this situation, it would be actionable. It would serve as a defense and as a basis for rescinding the agreement. Then the other one would be to prevent or correct a mistake. So if you know the other party's laboring under a mistake and you do not correct that mistake, and this one is controversial, right? This is one where, yes, there are, there are many courts that, in, at least in certain circumstances, have said that, he, that a party has a duty to correct this mistake. That this is, if you know the other party believes something and uh, that is untrue, about the situation that you have a duty to correct it. The problem is, as, mo as a lot of commentators have pointed out, is it's kind of unclear, right? Like th that, that is, okay, where, where does that end? Where does it begin? Because if they don't know something, one could argue they have a mistaken impression about the house, right? If they don't know it has a, ro a roach problem, is that a mistake? Um, 
And I, if I know they don't know because they haven't said anything or whatever, um, that I or I sus- strongly suspect they don't know. But that's really not, I think, what or, what you're finding with these cases because uh, I, I think this category to me is yes, this exists, but I think you want to be careful with it. it it's worth mentioning, obviously, when it comes up. But often, what they have in view are, are situations where. You may that the party may may have made a statement about the situation, and then uh, maybe it changes. The circumstances change, change, or um, maybe something. So there's the, there's actually a, a fairly famous case dealing with a situation where a guy is going to buy a large parcel of land, and he intends to divide it up and build houses on it. And at the time he they, they he first nego- is negotiating with the seller, he is he is able to get like the county still giving out permits and he should be able to divide it up and put all the necessary septic tanks and things on the property. Um, but as the transaction's moving forward, the seller knows that the county has decided to put a moratorium in place and to not issue any more permits. And so, but the buyer is apparently unaware of this and. Because the seller knows that the buyer is unaware uh, and and the seller is, the court said in that kind of situation, there was a duty to disclose. And the non-disclosure of that served as a basis, right? Because it, it had a material effect on the transaction because what, the whole reason he wanted to buy it wasn't going to, you know, he couldn't do what he wanted it to do. And the seller knew that and that uh, it wasn't something that was readily observable. And it wasn't something uh, obviously otherwise known to the buyer. And so the court said, in that kind of circumstance, that's a mistaken impression the person's under. You have a duty to correct. But we have to be careful, right? Because you can, that category can go, uh, could expand to encompass almost all circumstances where we're basically getting rid of any notion of um, the general rule of no, there's generally not a duty. But, um, it is nonetheless a category, and it exi- most states have cases on the books. So uh, it, it's something that's important to cover. So those are the four circumstances. Here's an example to look at of this kind of thing, right? That generally there's no duty to disclose. Bo, I love the house. I'll take it. Just hoping there's no roaches. So we'll assume in this circumstance that this is the first, you know, we're coming in here. There wasn't, she hadn't asked. Uh, about roaches. So this is just, she's looked over the house. She decides she's going to take it. She's not asked at all about, not directly asked Bo anything about roaches. She just says, just hoping there's no roaches. And here, if we jump ahead then, um, she moves in and there are roaches in the house. And so she's obviously upset. And then she wants to disaffirm. He should have told me about the roaches. They're super gross. And she sues to rescind, right? There, this is based on it. He didn't affirmatively say anything. So it's got to be based on a duty of non-disclosure, right? That uh, he had a duty to disclose, that this was a non-disclosure problem. And he says, sorry, nothing against you, but I'm not required to volunteer information. And here, it likely, her lawsuit would not work. Because it's very likely he did not have a duty to disclose. Because this is not a situation that where we'd say, well, uh, it's like, well, there, he knew there was a mistaken impression there and he had a duty to disclose. Instead, this is, you know, she was making some statements. He just, you know, she said, I hope there's not. And she didn't say, I know there's no roaches something like that. She said, I hope there's not, right? Uh, And he doesn't have to correct that hope. So that's it. What we can contrast that though with this, right? With these four circumstances. So we, whenever we're looking at non-disclosure, we want to think, but does it, does it match with any of these? Is there a statute? Was there intentional concealment? Are they in a relationship of trust and confidence? Is correcting a mistake? So what about here where Barb says, I understand you had the house inspected by an exterminator earlier this year and there were no roaches, which is great because I find roaches really gross. So here, um, no, but why would I correct a mistake that helps me? 
So she thinks, it, for whatever reason, she's under the impression that he previously had it inspected earlier in the year and that the house was fine, right? That there were no roaches. And so there, he knows that she believes something factually that's mistaken, right? And so if we give this mistake exception, it's sort of broadest interpretation where he knows this isn't just a, he knows that she hopes there are no roaches, which is not anything factual, but but here that she has a she believes something about the facts that is mistaken, right? That's incorrect. And does he have a duty to correct that, right? So she moves in, discovers the roaches, and then she wants to disaffirm. You should have told me about the roaches. They're super gross. Sorry, nothing against you, but why would I tell you something to make you not want to buy my house? The law, maybe? So here, she would be, again, suing to rescind based on non-disclosure, right? Disaffirming based on non-disclosure. And it would work if the court's willing to take a broad view that she was aware, he was aware that she had a mistake about a mistaken uh, a belief about the facts of the circumstance, uh, circumstances and uh, didn't correct it. As opposed to in the first one, that wasn't what it was. It was just, I hope there aren't roaches. Well, okay, great. And, you know, you may hope that, you know, your flowers grow well there. You may hope that your family's really happy there. There are all kinds of things may be true. And, you know, you can go, he has no duty to be like, well, you know, your flowers probably aren't going to grow well. Nobody's happy ever. So you're probably not going to be happy in the house. So that kind of thing. You know, it's like that. Now, so, well, that's non-disclosure. So we've looked at the statute of fraud so far, lack of capacity. Um, and remember there we looked at minority, mental capacity, and intoxication. Then we looked at duress and undue influence. And... Now, we've just looked at misrepresentation and non-disclosure. I hope the video is helpful. Uh, that's it for now. I'll be back with more um, where we'll uh, take a look at some more defenses. Uh, I believe unconscionability is next on the list. So we, but we'll keep ticking through them. So I hope it's helpful. As always, like and subscribe. And thanks for the support. Have a great rest of the day.